This iconic show has put an end to the devious lives of several perverts, but the actions of one such sicko put an end to the show itself. Yes, as crazy as that sounds, the Dateline NBC's To Catch a Predator literally ended after this episode aired. But before that, let's take a look at this next Predator who almost got the show cancelled. This is no joke, I mean this episode triggered some of the craziest reactions from viewers. Referring to the Predator in question, one fan said, how does someone do this type of thing twice in 24 hours? He's a danger to society, lock him up for life. Another said, how was this guy able to leave without being arrested? All the Predators are despicable, but this one is the worst. What kind of conduct is this for a high school teacher? This sicko named John Kennelly went under the guise of Special Guy 29, but honestly, if you ask me, there was nothing special about him. If at all he was something, he was a creep of the highest order. We've seen predators who are really cautious before making their way into the sting house. They try to make sure everything looks safe and sound before going ahead with their dreadful plans. And that is exactly what Kennelly did as well. The cameras caught a middle-aged man in shorts pacing around the house. The very next shot we see Kennelly taking his shirt off. You know, what would be really hot, strip down your underwear in the garage and walk in. Perhaps he wanted to change into something better, but no, 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 cause what this guy was up to is really alarming. Let's quickly recap how we got here in the first place. John Kennelly was lured into a chat by one of the decoys, and just as we expected, he was caught trying to have sex connotations with an underage boy, and these chats that led him to the trap were truly horrifying. While the very fact that he indulges in such an obscene conversation with a kid is enough reason to jail him, but the decoy plays along in an attempt to see how far he could go. During one such chat, a sort of joke seems to have transpired between the decoy and Kennelly, but the man was so blinded by his urges that he took it literally. While oftentimes, the decoy asked the predator to bring a few presents, like maybe some snacks, or video games, etc, etc. This time, the decoy had a somewhat strange request. The 23-year-old woman who was posing as a 14-year-old boy suggested to Kennelly that it would be more arousing if Kennelly arrived just in his underwear when he came to the house. But how this man who works at a high school replies is even more disturbing than you think. You just have to see how this conversation builds up. I don't wear underwear, so the decoy says, then come in naked. Now, obviously the decoy was trying to pull his leg, but who knew that Kennelly would take this request seriously? With no idea that he has been caught in a trap, Kennelly arrives at the house and proceeds to strip inside the garage. Kennelly was sure of what was to follow once he was inside the house, so sure that this is how he showed up. Oh, Did this guy just show up stark naked? Forget me, none of them watching the CCTV footage could believe it. Not the decoy and not even Chris Hansen. And what's more, during the chats that took place between Kennelly and the decoy, there seems to have transpired a joke of sorts. But Kennelly is so blinded by his urges that he doesn't just take it as a joke. Kennelly didn't come empty handed, he had a huge bag of presents he had brought along for the supposed young boy. This bozo was so shameless that he simply placed the bag on the counter and took a seat by the counter. It didn't bother him even for a bit that he was walking around buck naked in someone else's house. Kennelly then patiently proceeds to wait in his seat expecting his young partner for the night to show up, but that is not what happens. You would think that a person would be startled by the sound of boots, but Kennelly had so many things running inside his filthy head that he didn't notice Hanson pulling up behind him. It was only when Hanson spoke up that Kennelly realized he had been busted. Could you explain yourself? I'm sorry. Shocked to see Hanson, a flustered Kennelly tried to cover himself before sitting down and talking. Kennelly surprisingly seemed pretty apologetic for his actions and even told Hanson that the decoy had texted him asking to come over. Clearly, Kennelly had no idea who Hanson was since he assumed the well-dressed man must have been the boy's father. Hanson decides to play along and asks him how his son had texted Kennelly to come over buck naked, but Kennelly tries to beat around the bush. When Hanson asked him for his age, Kennelly revealed that he was 29 years old and worked as a school bus driver. This is gut churning cause a school had actually hired a predator to work for them. When Hanson puts forward more questions, the real truth comes out that Kennelly was not a school bus driver, but a teacher at the local school. This makes things even worse since nobody knows how many children have already fallen prey to this disgusting man. With further investigation, Hanson finds out that Kennelly had been lying both times about his employment. Despite being unemployed at the time, he got busted. 
And now it was time for Hansen to ask the most pressing question, and the reply he got was absolutely unbelievable. What would have happened, John, if I wasn't here? I probably would have chickened out, sir. Chickened out? Chickened out? Did he just come here naked with 12 packs of beer to chicken out? But this guy was a born liar and a born pervert. Less than 24 hours later, Kennelly had not learned a single thing from his actions. With absolutely no regard to what had just transpired between him and Hanson, Kennelly was back to his antics. Oblivious to the fact that his chats were being monitored, Kennelly strikes a conversation with yet another underage child who he decides to meet with at a restaurant. Hanson and the camera crew were waiting for him at the location. And this is where he was cornered once again. I just came to get something to eat. John, we've been through this before. What are you doing? I've got the chat log again. Stupid. Sadly, back in the first season, which is when this episode aired, Hanson did not work closely with the cop. But despite the involvement of the police forces, this next predator's actions put a hold on the show forever. Hanson and his team were surveilling the online accounts that they had created in order to trap predators. And while this was going on, a rather concerning individual made contact with the team. The involvement of a person who holds a high position meant that this episode would rack up millions of views. And so the team decided to go with it. But what they didn't know was that it would be their last predator that they were on to. The man in question is Lewis William Conrad Jr., a prosecutor in the state of Texas. And this man was no regular man of the law. He was the assistant district attorney. It's a mystery even to this day why a man with such a reputation would stoop so low as to try and indulge in such heinous acts, especially since the man had been a criminal defendant for the entirety of his career. But there is a very strong message we can all take home from this sting. There are perverts who turn out to be predators in all walks of life. No matter where you are and what you do, a pervert is gonna be a pervert till the end of his life. Now, since the man in question has dealt with criminal investigations all his life, the crew had to be extra careful so their cover isn't blown. And so, the decoy team managed to catch the attorney Lewis Conrad's attention thanks to a hired actor who pretended to be an underage boy. The chats go on for about two weeks, and within this time, Conrad has made contact at least every day with the decoy across several phone calls. Now, let us remind you, each and every conversation that went down during these illicit phone calls were not only recorded, but also being analyzed. As the two build a report and get comfortable, Conrad starts to reveal his filthy desires to the decoy. The prosecutor sent pictures to the decoy and even spoke in a manner. The man even admitted that he would lie to see the boy m Again, let's not forget that the attorney was well aware that this boy he was talking to was an underage teen, but that did not keep him from building fanciful ideas in his head. To make sure they had the right lead and get the man punished, the decoy team were constantly in touch with the cops. And finally, they settled in on a day for the much-awaited meetup at the Sting House. But that's when Conrad senses something fishy. He got a whiff of doubt and almost immediately bailed on the chat. And how did the team discover this? On D-Day, the team had everything in place, from the cameras to the mics to the transcripts, and even the cops. Everybody was pumped to catch the high-profile predator red-handed. But guess what? Conrad never showed up. Okay, okay, so considering this man held a high position, it's obvious that he was a busy man. So maybe he simply had a last-minute errand to make, or maybe he got delayed in court. Who knows? It could be anything. All they have to do is just set up a meeting all over again. But Conrad was not busy. He had fled. The man had deliberately given the meeting a miss. He had even deleted the online account he was using for this purpose. Basically, he had gone off the radar. But just as I said earlier, due to the high sensitivity of this issue, the legal authorities had to be involved right from day one. By the time Conrad had bailed, the police were already ready with an arrest warrant for him. Yes, the very fact that he indulged in conversations with a minor is enough reason to arrest him. And so, the cops managed to get a search warrant for his house, and it was now time for them to head out and make the arrest. The cops first surrounded Conrad's place and prepared themselves for the encounter. To ensure they don't intimidate him into fleeing away, they sent in an officer who he was already familiar with. But despite knocking for a while, there was no answer from inside the house. Although Conrad's personal devices were still turned on, looks like the cops would have to break in. The police then managed to get inside, and what follows is an absolute state of radio silence, and this lasted for five whole minutes. None of the cops who entered the building found any signs of life. 
but this is a concerning situation as they had just a little while earlier confirmed movement inside the house. Well, this brings us down to the only possible explanation in the given scenario. Conrad had probably already fled the scene, but things were a lot worse in reality. When Lieutenant Adana Barber walked out of the building, she had some explanations to make, and just by her body and facial expressions, it was clear that this encounter did not end well. Tensions were high. Everyone was speculating about what could have happened inside the house. Did they arrest Conrad, or did he manage to flee? The suspense had reached a boiling point. Lieutenant Barber was burdened with the responsibility of sharing the nitty-gritty details of what had transpired inside the house, and so she went on to elaborate in great detail how the SWAT team had successfully infiltrated the building. She said, As they made entry, they confronted the suspect. I believe he's in the hallway, and he told them he wasn't going to hurt them. And then up in the head. And he had a pistol in his hand. That's it. The 56-year-old was so ashamed of his actions that he decided to take his own life. But was it worth it? I guess we'll never know. Almost immediately, the emergency medical team arrived at the scene to examine the body and evaluate any chances of survival. Surprisingly, Conrad still held on to his dear life. He was then carried out in a stretcher and airlifted to the nearest hospital. And that was about it. A little while later, the assistant district attorney was pronounced dead. Well, that's definitely not the kind of end I would want for any predator, this site sent shockwaves across the political world, particularly in Texas. And guess who was blamed? NBC Dateline's most popular show to catch a predator. The show was put under a lot of pressure from this point on, and Conrad's sister Patricia Conrad even filed a lawsuit against Dateline NBC for a large sum. That was encouraged by an out-of-control reality show. I will never consider my brother's death a s at this point, the trigger was pointed towards the entire crew of the highly dramatic television show. When Hansen interviewed one of the officers involved in the case and asked him why they hurried with the arrest, he said, We didn't want there to be any more destruction of the records and evidence tampering things than, than what had already taken place. But it looks like none of the precautions worked out, as the three computers that were found at Conrad's home were secured by ultra-complex security features. This meant none of the contents of the three retrieved hard drives were accessible. As for the case, it was eventually settled in 2008 by NBC, and this meant more harm for the show than you can imagine. NBC Dateline had to shell out $105 million in an out-of-court settlement to subdue Conrad's sister's lawsuit. But that was not it. The cops involved with the show were heavily criticized for improper execution of their duties. They were snubbed for being merely a player in the show and had no real law enforcement position. While on the other hand, NBC was criticized for leading police operations at the expense of safety and justice, and that is not even the worst consequence of Conrad's death. As for the lawsuit filed, none of the predators who were caught in the sting could be prosecuted. Different reasons were stated in all the arrests, and all the predators managed to escape justice. Can you believe that? All the cases against the predators caught over the three years of the show were dismissed. As for the star of the show, Chris Hansen, the TV host revealed in an interview that he had absolutely no regrets in the way the entire sting operation was handled. It's a great show and I have a lot of respect for the Dan Abrams and the people involved in it and, and go way back with him to our mm -hmm. days at NBC. According to Hansen, although the I did have an effect on the show, it was not the reason for it being pulled off the channel. In an interview, he said, The production became very expensive and what NBC figured out is that they had a lot of material that could be repackaged, repurposed, and re-aired for many years to come. To me, this looks like a major conspiracy. Probably just like Conrad, there was some other high-profile dude who was involved in getting dirty with underage kids. And before his truth is revealed to the world, he grabbed onto his opportunity and shut the entire thing down. Meet Ham Bubger. Yes, this is the same guy who sparked off a wide range of memes on the net. The man was so creepy that he left a disturbing legacy behind him. So Ham Bubger was the screen name of a 53-year-old retired truck driver from Jack Jacksonville, Florida. There is no doubt that this pedo raised the bar of spookiness like never before. The man we're talking about is James Wiles, and he was en route to the Flagler Beach House with some really evil intentions. One thing I have to say, evil or not, Wiles was smart. Just take a look at the screen name he went by. He could easily catch an underage kid's attention. It didn't sound spooky or intimidating like most other predators. If anything, it was really catchy. I mean, Ham Bubger sounds like a silly guy on the other side, but behind all of it was a man whose intentions were anything but funny, and the decoy who was claimed to be 13 years old found out about his dirty and dark truth pretty early in their chat. Once Claire, who hailed from Daytona Beach, contacted Wiles, he did not waste any time to get down to business. He was outright and honest about his intentions right from the beginning, and what's more, he gave his dirty intentions the name of love. What better way to lead a child into the wrong path than play with their fickle emotions? And this man was no rookie to this atrocious activity. 
activity. Wiles was so desperate that he got straight to the point. He skipped all of the introductions and everything else and directly told Claire that he wanted to her. But of course, he didn't force her into anything, since he wanted it to be her decision in the end. Quite the clever play, don't you think? Once he sensed that Claire was in on his game, he went on to detail every bit of what he wanted to do with her, and the way he described it is sure to turn your stomach. The decoy Claire played along with Wiles, since it was crucial that the team get him over to the sting house. When Wiles said that he wanted to flick his tongue inside of her, Claire gave him assurance by saying that she wouldn't mind doing anything he asked, as long as he was gentle. Sure Surely the team was no stranger to this awful psychological game going back and forth. Wiles also hadn't noticed anything suspicious in the chats and continued, unaware that he had been caught in the trap. Wiles had many more fantasies that he mentioned to Claire, and one of them was that when the two meet, he'd like it if Claire was in her under- Oh wait, not just any underwear, but a pink one to be exact. Claire responded and told Wiles that she didn't mind any of that, but she also had a request of her own. She asked Wiles whether he could grab her a couple of M&Ms on the way, and this statement sealed the deal. Wiles had arrived at the house where a 19-year-old actress had been hired by Dateline NBC to play the role of Claire. This man could hardly walk straight. I'm not sure what he was ailing from physically, but when it comes to his head, this man was definitely sick. Once inside, Claire inquired if he got what she had asked for, and yup, he had kept his side of the deal. And now, it was time for Claire to keep hers. And so, under the pretense of changing her clothes, Claire left the room. In split seconds, Wiles began preparing for what was to follow. He was in such a hurry that almost immediately he started to play around with his man tool. And that's exactly when Chris Hansen made an entry. But Wiles was unfazed. I'm out there. Yeah? What are you doing here today? I'm trying to see her. When Hanson asked him if he knew what the age of the girl was, Wiles claimed that he did not intend to have s 13 year old girl, but was only here for a visit. When Hanson tried to read out the chat logs, the pervert blatantly jumped in to make his point, and what he said next will prove to you that he was way more twisted than you would have ever thought. Well, you have to see this to believe it. We will be making love all the time I'm there, okay, cool, with my tongue up your blank. Gosh, this guy was really crazy. Who speaks like that? But Hanson was no fool to fall for his lies. Hanson decides to cut the crap and reveal his true identity, but Wiles continued to remain calm and composed. It was as if he already knew that he wouldn't get into much trouble. He, however, insisted that all he was looking for was friendship. Yeah, right. Just as he was about to leave, the inevitable happened. It's police who are gonna do the arrest. Turn around. Once at the police headquarters, Wiles was questioned about his vile intentions, but he repeatedly refused to give in. Despite being charged on four counts, the police end up making a grave mistake. They let him go! Although Wiles was conditionally released, this was all that he needed to make a run. He was on the run for a while before getting arrested. However, this too lasted only a brief time. So did he escape again? Well, this time, he died! James Wilde died in his cell even before he could get convicted. Sure, there's no greater escape than death, but a source revealed that his last few days were extremely painful. In this case, do you think death came as a punishment or maybe a means of escape? While I let you give that a good thought, this next predator came along with his escape plan. While predators usually bring drinks or chocolates, this one brought something else. Um, correction, someone else actually. Here comes another computer engineer. Double dates are usually fun, but when it involves underage kids, it's downright disgusting. Well, that pretty much sums up this next predator's story. I will kiss you from top to bottom. I will treat you nicely. How do you like to be loved? 25-year-old Polkit Matur chatted up with a decoy named Kiera. Matur, a computer engineer by profession, went by the screen name Pookie007US, and from what I understand, this wasn't his first interaction with an underage teen. Kiera made it a point to bring up her age often during the conversation, but Matur didn't seem to be bothered by the fact that the girl was just 13 years old. All he wanted was once Matur zeroed in on a date, he then went on to ask Kiera a very strange question. Matur wanted to know if the 13-year-old had a friend who would be interested to spend the night with them. Oh no, he wasn't looking for a th he was looking for a th partner for his friend. The only problem being, they were dealing with kids. And uh, what'd you guys bring? I love sandwiches. Oh yes, I love sandwiches. 
When the decoy asked them to get into the hot tub, both the men were beaming with excitement, but soon it would all be washed away. Just as the decoy left to change, Chris Hansen popped up from nowhere, and this is what he asked. What are you guys doing? Look at this. We need to have some food and all. Some food. Both the men were in absolute shock, but neither of them wanted to show their distress. Mator then explained that he was in the U.S. on business matters and that he wasn't a permanent resident of the country. Probably he thought being a foreigner meant he would be free, but sadly for him, it proved to be more trouble. What was he expecting? Like as if we don't have enough predators out here that we would encourage others to roam free. When Kanish kept trying to prove his innocence, Hansen pulled out the chat logs. At that very moment, Mator realized that they were in deep he tries to rubbish the chat logs by saying this. No, it's right here. Yeah, yeah I might have chatted, but uh, that was only for, like, that's a chatting. That's not nothing intentional. But when the heat started to rise, Kanish threw his friendship out of the window and his friend under the bus. He blamed the entire thing on Mature and said that he was only here to help him around the town. But was he as innocent as he claimed to be? Of course not. Kanish was himself in touch with another 13-year-old decoy. When the decoy asked him what sort of things guys do with girls, he gave a very sly answer. It was so smart that he answered her question and yet did not say anything sleazy. Well, this is what he said. Come on, Amanda, you don't know that? And then says, for the same reason, Pulkit is meeting Kira. After Hanson reveals himself, both the men start to sh bricks. Right off the bat, they started apologizing, but it only fell on deaf ears. Both the men were escorted to the police headquarters for further interrogation. Was convicted of his felonies. He managed to avert the authorities by skipping his court date. He probably fled the country before any more restrictions were put into place. Kanish, on the other hand, managed to get away since his chats did not have substantial evidence against him. Now, let me tell you what is scary about this encounter. It's not just the fact that two predators got away, it's even more worrisome that they knew how to get away. But this next predator may made the lamest excuse when asked why he came to meet the underage team. What did you think it was? Truly, truly a setup. And why would somebody try to do a setup? To catch people that shouldn't be talking to. 53-year-old Stanley Kendall was a high school math teacher. Just think about all the kids he was in contact with. Anything could have happened to anyone. But online, Stanley went by the screen name StainMac1. To exercise his hair-raising fantasies, Stanley struck up a conversation with a 13-year-old boy. Barely two minutes into that chat, Kendall asked the boy whether he would like to play with him. To get more clarity, the decoy asked him what he meant by it. And this is when Kendall continues to explicitly explain what he intended to do as play. In his own words, he said, I love to play and play with and lick Coming from a man of his age and reputation, this is absolutely shocking. When the decoy tried to act innocent, Kendall offered to teach him how to do things. And this time, it wasn't about math. He first sent a photo of his and this is how the rest of the conversation went like. Do you want to play with it? Well, only if you're nice to me and don't make fun of me if I don't do something right. Of course, I can teach you by doing it to you. The only thing Kendall wanted in return was the reassurance that the cops wouldn't be involved. This is quite a sly ploy since Kendall was fully aware of what he was doing. However, he had already given the cops enough evidence to book him under various felonies. But that's not what happened. Cut to when Kendall entered the sting house. The decoy offered him a drink, but Kendall refused to take it. The decoy then asked him to elaborate on what they were about to do. But even before he could finish replying, Hanson walks right in saying, A lesson planned for tonight. Oops. Sorry for what? I thought, I thought this was a joke. He thought, what was a joke? He thought this was a what? A joke? Okay. Are you kidding me? Kendall tries desperately to prove his innocence and even reveals that he is a sixth grade math teacher at a school nearby. But Hanson immediately takes this point and turns it around at Kendall. They have a conversation like this and come visit a 13 year old boy. What have you been doing with students? Kendall, however, was offended that Hanson was trying to sling mud at his profession, to which he had dedicated 23 long years. Well, the job which he was gloating about so much was now in jeopardy, and so he tried his best to get off the hook and started to apologize repeatedly. However, he was thrown behind bars. Kendall's bail was set at $50,000, and he was also placed on administrative leave indefinitely. He went on to serve his time in jail for a few months, but something happened. How did this old man escape? Did someone help him break out? Not literally but that's exactly what happened. I'm not entirely sure if Kendall got back to teaching, but it's bad enough that he was let out into the streets again. But this next predator does something crazy when he sees the camera crew. I gotta take off. Sir, sir, I need to talk to you for a minute. 
Maurice Wolin had a noble job, but an equally disgusting mind. The cancer research doctor, despite all of his qualifications, found pleasure in exploiting the innocence of underage teens. The doctor pulled up to the decoy's house, who claimed to be 13 years old. He tries to initiate a conversation between them as he pours himself a drink. We all know what this is leading up to, but how did he get here in the first place? Going by the name of Tall Dreamy Doc, Wolin had started a conversation with the decoy by introducing himself to be 29 years old. In truth, he was all of 48. Wolin made nasty comments about how he wanted to caress the decoy's and how he was aroused. He even asked the decoy to f*** herself while thinking about him. Well, Wolin knew what he was doing, since he even mentioned that if he were to get caught, it would be a lot of trouble for him. Which makes me wonder, why then take the risk at all? Meanwhile, let's go back to when Wolin poured himself a drink. I'm not sure if he had shaky hands or was just being clumsy, but he ended up spilling all over the counter. In order to clear the mess up, he goes in search of a towel, and that is when this happened. I gotta take off. Sir. After spotting Chris Hansen and the entire camera crew, Wolin bolts towards the exit, but how far can he really get? Before we get to that, since you got this far in my video, I'm sure as you're enjoying it. So to make sure you stay updated with all the amazing content that I have for you, make sure to drop a like and subscribe to my channel. Let's see what happens with the demented doctor. He spent two months in jail and got a lifetime registration as a registered Bender. Doesn't seem like the most effective punishment after what he had done. His license to practice medicine was revoked after his conviction, but Wolin doesn't end it there just yet. He hires an attorney to fight his case for over two years before pleading no contest. This man did not deserve to get off that easily, but somehow that's what happened. Despite all the heinous acts they committed, these predators escaped justice. The show went to great lengths to capture these perverts, but one single lawsuit against the show screwed everything up for them. You think perverted justice should make a comeback? Back. Well, I sure do. But would Chris Hansen agree to host the show? Now that's something we've got to find out. Meanwhile, keep your eyes and ears open, for perverts like these are often right under your nose. With that, I'm heading off. Thanks for watching, guys.